Well, welcome to the follow-up podcast. My name is Hayden. I am the worship director here at Arbor Church, and today I am joined by Allison Oconey, our community care pastor, Cliff Tatama, our interim pastor and speaker from Sunday, and in the booth today we have Brian Cobley, who is still... We, we did a take before this, but Brian was busy working, and it looks like he's still working, so I hope everything's going well back there, Brian. He gives me a thumbs up. He does have a microphone, but he's busy working away at the, the soundboard and the computer. But let's hop into uh, this Sunday, and I'll just keep gazing over at Brian and make sure we're good to go. Um, Cliff, this was the third week of um, Priorities. So first week was God first, second week was battle strategies, this week was, um, don't tell me, don't tell me, I know it, I know it, it's uh, one job. Yes. Perfect, sorry, I had a brain fart, so. Um, this uh, this one kind of came in between the, uh, well, battle strategies, obviously, but before this we had um, God first, and then we've talked about the final message or the two that you've been the most excited to share about is Go Ye, the Great Commission, and uh, God First, the story of um, Joshua, right? Yes. Yes. So yeah. these two, I will not use the word filler because I don't think that they're filler at all, but you, these were two sermons that you have that I had not heard you talk about before we started getting into this series. So where did some of the inspiration come for, uh, um, sorry, Forgetting already. Uh, job and job. One job, yeah. Job and job, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Where did the inspiration come for for those messages? Um. Well, you know, I think uh, they were definitely pri- they definitely are priorities. Yeah. And um, and I love the fact that with the one that we just did on one job, is that Jesus tells this parable that really does narrow it all the way back down to what our responsibility is. So we start out with just saying that God is first. Then we talk about you know the the spiritual aspects of how to do life, mm-hmm. and then we talk about really what the what the the primary function of of our relationship with God, what He created us to do, and to make it that simple. And then then the next week we're going to talk about what's it look like to carry that out. What are one of the things the strategies of the job? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. We started putting this series together. We one of the working titles that we had, but we didn't go with, was the main thing, right? Right. And then we decided priorities fit it better. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting that in a series about priorities, we have a week that we talk about one job, right? Which mm-hmm. can feel kind of like, oh, it's kind of paradoxical to talk about your list of priorities, but then go, here's your one job. So was that something that you had thought about? Like, okay, even though we have this huge list of priorities, this one thing's going to take, you know, the top of this list. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not at all. Okay. Until you just said, yeah. it, I thought that is kind of paradoxical. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I'll have to look up what that word means. But it's well, I thought it was I- ironic, mm-hmm. and I don't think we could show your uh, sermon bumper oh, that yeah. you had created. But <laughs> uh-huh. basically, it was a note, and you were mm-hmm. listing off all the priorities in life. Yeah, and then you wrote the word God, Mm -hmm. and then you pulled it up towards the top, and then everything else dissolved. And I think that's, in a way, what priorities Mm -hmm. is boiling down to in this sermon here, is that, yeah, you have so much to manage and all Mm -hmm. that, but really, once God is at the top, everything else fades. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was really a Holy Spirit thing, because we should have collaborated for weeks on that, Mm -hmm. Yeah. but you just came up with it completely independent of me. Oh, the, the, view, the, the bumper. bumper and all yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. Well, the, it was yeah. funny. Brian and Allison had both said that they loved it. And it was something where I was, I think it was like a Friday night before we started the series. And I was like, I had some ideas for like the main thing, you know? And the, the funny thing is the subject matter didn't change. It was just the title, right? Yes. But I, th- when I, when you guys bring up series, I'm starting to think like graphically or video wise, like where, where can we go with this? And the note thing kind of came to mind because I think of, Think of any time where you've had like some sort of like runoff in terms of responsibilities or like maybe you haven't handled things well and you think, all right, I'm going to get the notepad out and I'm going to physically write this down. And that's where my brain went with priorities was like, okay, if this is, you know, we're going into the summer, we want to get things back on track. Let's start with like a checklist of like where are we at? And 
I think with what's interesting about one job in relationship to priorities is I think a lot of times we think if we just put God at the top, everything else will fall in line. That's true to an extent, but you have to do the hard work of the other steps along the way. You, it, you really can't just say, I'm going to honor God and then hope that the rest of your life falls in line. If that's your true intent, I think that you'll, you'll get there. But there's a lot of hard work along the way. It's like being prepared for spiritual warfare, right? Right, right. You could say, I'm going to love God and follow after him. But if you're not prepared, if you haven't done the hard work of looking at what's happened in the Bible, you're not going to be able to honor God in all of, all of right. your life unless you've created that list of priorities and focused on those things. So I don't, I was just asking if you thought about one job in relationship to priorities, but really I think it was a smart way of doing this. You know, you know what is funny is when Allison was just talking about that, about the bumper, mm-hmm. um, and, and when I first saw it, uh, I thought, oh, that's really cool, dude. This is exactly what you just described. Yeah. Obviously, in the list and all that. But as she's describing it, I'm going, oh man, that really is cool. How that ties in with everything. And I got to tell you, it it it's a, it's amazing to me how often we are saying that when you're saying, yeah. And then we thought about this within. Did you think about? It? And we're going, kind of no. The yeah. Holy Spirit just mm-hmm. lined those things up. You know, yeah. even when you're when you start out saying it's not my way or your way, it's yeah. God's way. Well, that's putting God at the top, but until you really re- think about it and realize, you know what, everything I am and everything I have is actually His. Until you actually start processing that, like you just said, having God at the top, everything else isn't just going to fall underneath there. Because you can say God's up there, but until you start really seeing it as, no, wait a minute, I'm His. What I have is His. Then He starts to actually being a top in a way that does affect what comes underneath that. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. And then the trick is when you get married to somebody else who's got their list of the way everything <laughs> falls down, like honoring God to me looks like the you know, living it out this way. And then your spouse is like, actually, I see it differently. And then you're mm-hmm. like, how did the two combine? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So and then you say, I thought God created marriage. <laughs> right. This was his idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How does it happen? We have different ideas. How does it happen? Yeah. yeah. But anyhow, isn't life fun? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm curious, when you put together the idea for one job, I um, I don't know if it's just something that mentally goes on with me and it's maybe unique to myself, but I think about the interesting relationship that we have being pastors or like Brian and I directors, um, <laughs> being pastors or directors and, <laughs> and, um, ministry leaders, ministry leaders. Yeah. And having, um, congregants come in on a Sunday. Right. And we talk about our job, right. And we're talking about a different job and saying one job, but then having people who do work a nine to five and sometimes it can feel maybe like a little hypocritical because, our vocational job has a lot of uh, overlap with the one job we're talking about. And I, I'm curious, is that something that runs through your head? Because I imagine in your life you've had a job outside of vocational ministry. Yes. So do you ever feel the tension of, okay, I'm talking about people's jobs, and I'll, sometimes a lot of people's identity is found in their career, good or bad, right? Right. Is that relationship something that you think of, I don't want to step too harshly on, you know, someone's career pursuits or how this lines up with where they've been working towards? Oh, oh, that's a great, great question, Hayden. I think that if you do not take those pursuits and realize and want God to influence and direct them, Mm -hmm. then you're not really making that part of your one job to start with. And ironically, you can, we have a, it's a little bit of a, two-edged sword because we can do this in ministry and all of a sudden we think that means just because we're in ministry that we are Mm -hmm. when it doesn't i mean god may or may not want you where you're at or he might be planning to move you here and are you listening to him are you willing to do what he's asking you to do and to put that over career advancement or something like that Yeah. yeah yeah i think you know one of the other things that that i've always felt like with staff and in churches is uh, because people are get so involved in their jobs, if, especially if you do them well, uh, um, and we do too, but in ministry, are, I'm always asking the question, am I 
doing what I'm asking other people to do. You know, we love it when people become part of Arbor and they say, how else can I help serve? But then I think we have to ask ourselves the same question. How else are we serving other than what we are doing as our vocation? Mm -hmm. And um, so I've always felt like I've always looked for those things that I can be doing that take a portion of my time that's the same as I'm asking other people to do by being engaged in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you actually, in your sermon, pointed out um, one of your points was specifically uh, asking about what people do for work and, and remind people, like, okay, leaving the church and going to do what we're talking about is the point. It's not you weren't asking people for like more volunteer hours here. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> you were saying yeah. like, actually all of this kingdom work, it, your one job is outside of these walls. Yes. So, yeah, I, I love when you, when you just look at God's word and you start, and that's what happened with that one is, uh, as I was reading that parable, I went, Oh my goodness. Jesus is just, he's making it really clear what we're called to do here. I mean, he's making it really clear. And then as I began to think about that and thinking, and this is the way that I prepare my messages is, okay, what else is he showing us here? Oh, he's showing us that there are actually three responses mm -hmm. to what he's asking us to do. And the nobleman is asking them to do this. And mm -hmm. so, you know, for me, when you begin to process it like that, it was one of, it was one of those things that uh, I try to teach it the same way I receive it a little bit at times like that. So for me, it was kind of like, wait a minute, where do you do business? Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't do business in the church. Mm -hmm. You're coming to the church to get refueled mm -hmm. to go do business. Mm -hmm. And then you can say, oh, we've got to leave the building to be about our king's business. Mm -hmm. That changes our, our concept of, I think, a lot of people who come to church, their concept of what it's about. This isn't where I'm doing ministry. No, no this, I'm going to go engage in business for my king as soon as I leave here in this next week. So what's that look like for you? Mm. I'm curious, just looking at the scripture, and this might be a great time for Brian to... The Bible answer me. Yeah, to, to join us. He he just looks stressed back there. I'm looking back, and he's he's looking over things. Are you okay, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't very convincing. That, was, that wasn't convincing. Was no. that even in a microphone? No. Oh, okay. No, you're asking him to do too many things back there. I guess I am. We have a new him. tech rep back uh, there, folks. So, so sorry. I, I was reading through the parable, and I, uh, I mean, Brian and I went to Bible college together. We took a lot of the same classes, but I think Brian has just excelled in his Bible knowledge, whereas I have just gotten by with it. And um, I'm curious, reading through that parable, what, when I first read it at surface value, I thought, this feels like a little bit prosperity gospel-ish, you know? The whole, I gave you this, you came back with this, so I'm going to give you even more. What would, I guess, be the defense against this is not saying, if you're very faithful, God is just going to make you prosper? Yeah. Uh, so I would ask the question, whose was it that they got to work with to begin with? Right? Yeah. It was the owners. It was the noblemen. It was the kings. Yeah. And when they got done, whose was it? It was still the kings. It yeah. was still the noblemen's. And if we approach life that way and say, God, I'm in it for you. I'm managing what you've given me. Show me how I can best manage this. Yeah. And then he blesses that. As uh, Allison wrote the quote down, which I'm going to remember here in a second, you can, without possessing anything. You can, let's see. You can possess a lot and without own owning, nothing. Yes, without owning anything, without owning nothing. And that's where that, that, as I thought about that, I thought, wow, wow, we can possess a lot. looks like we have it, but it's not ours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't own any of it. It's his. Okay. And that, that flies in the face of the idea of I get more. Yeah. And when, when Hayden's talking about prosperity doctrine, just to be clear, yeah. what that says really is if I do what I think God w wants me to, then basically he's got to bless me financially. Yeah. And, and it's mine that he's blessing me with. And this parable actually, to me, as you look at, to it deeper, flies in the yeah. face of that and says, no, it's not yours. Mm -hmm. It's still the king's. It's still yeah. the nobleman's. So, yeah. And then the flip side of prosperity gospel would be, um, if I'm not rich, there's something wrong in my spiritual life. Yes. I'm not doing something correct because I don't have 
the financial riches, you know, the wealth. Right. So, right. Yeah. And I think that's why, that's why that one piece is I, as I was processing that and thinking about it and thinking about my own life, I'm not a wealthy person and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh man, what about people who feel like they failed, but mm. they really are all in for Jesus, yeah. but their life would look like yeah. it's not successful from our perspective of what success is financial yeah. success is, worldly success is. And that's when I realized, oh, wait a minute. If you're all in for him, if you're his servant and you're and with whatever you have, you're you're saying, God, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna manage this as best I can for you, there is no failure. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what it looks like from the world's perspective. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was I, comforting for me. And yeah. that's scalable too, because they say for the gospel to be true, it needs to be true in every culture, in every, you know, across poverty lines, et cetera. Mm. Um, so that is scalable because yes. whether you're the rich Manhattan hotel owner or manager or whatever in your example that you had given, or you are um, living more in squalor or just very simply, um, is that true? That everything you have and possess it belongs to the Lord and that everything you do is an investment towards his kingdom and not your own. Right. So, yes, that's scalable. So, i.e., the gospel is true. Yeah, that's good. I didn't think of that. That makes me feel better. Oh, good. No, no, you passed, you passed that. Yeah. Check. Whoosh. Yeah, 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 it was good. One of the things I did in, in preparation for this podcast was obviously re read through that, the, the scripture that you camped at. I think you included like Ephesians 2 as yeah. well, but yeah. I focused on the Luke 19. And um, I was taken aback. I don't know if, I, I think... At this point in the message, I was either talking with Jeff, who runs tech, or something like that, so I didn't get to hear the end of that passage. But I was honestly kind of surprised by the harsh language of Jesus at the end of that parable. What did you think of that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had to really think about that. Yeah. Because I thought I felt the same way. When you first read it, you're going, gosh, man, these people are going to get slaughtered. They're, they're really, what, Lord, what is that about? Yeah. You know, why, why are you so angry at them? And that was what I was thinking of as I read it. Why are you so angry at them? And all of a sudden, it just hit me. Actually, I'm giving them what they wanted. Mm. What? Yeah. They wanted separation from me. Mm. They wanted nothing to do with me. Mm. That's what they wind up with. Mm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a frightening thought. But it's actually a really honest thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, Slash, it's comforting to know that if you do want him, like, he's there for you, right? Yes. So it's more like if you don't want him, right. he's not. Right. right. Yes. So it, yes. I think the fear comes from when you think that you're far from him because he put you there <laughs> versus, like, by choice. Yes, these are people who've chosen right. that place. God is so gracious. I believe that he gives everyone a choice. Mm -hmm. And that I don't know how that works with people who've never heard the gospel. I don't know exactly how yeah. that works. But I, I just believe that because, because that's the theology that I see God operating with. He's a just God. Mm -hmm. So how that's going to work, I don't know. But I am absolutely convinced mm -hmm. everyone has an opportunity to choose, yeah. and the one he's and more than one opportunity. Oh, often yeah. multiple opportunities, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, and the ones he's talking about there have made the choice. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want nothing to do with it, mm -hmm. and I don't know if if you've had the opportunity. I, I, I imagine uh, because you know your 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 youth betrays you here, <laughs> Hayden. Uh, but I think I'm certain Allison has. Where you're, you, somebody is close to death. Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> I saw that look. Wait, so what does now that I'm mean? close Wait, to does death. Does that yeah. mean I'm not? Now I'm no. close to death. <laughs> no, youth, is, youth has escaped you now. And, and I can only say that because it's escaped me a whole lot longer ago than it did no, you. I, but I'm, anyway. I, yeah, I'm not kidding anybody, am I? <laughs> <laughs> Me and my youth yeah. youth group sweatshirt in your youth and my messy bun. I yes. I am yes. close to death. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <Gosh. continue>. Yeah, <laughs> we, wow. Wow. Did we get off of that? I have no idea what I was going to say. Now. So you were saying Hayden's young, so may not have seen this, but when you oh, were my I, age yes. and close to death. Well, I, well, I'll just put it this way. <laughs> 
I'll back the truck up on that completely and say what I have seen, yeah. <laughs> acknowledging my ancientness, I have seen people very close to death who know they're going to die, who have not accepted Christ, and now you have an opportunity to lead them to that place. Mm. And I've seen that where they have accepted that in the last moment, right? Mm -hmm. But I've also seen it where they see it right in front of them and they continue to reject it. Wow. And it's not, it's, at that point, it's not even, I don't think, an intellectual exercise where they're just saying, well, I just can't believe this. It's a, no, I refuse to accept that. Yeah, I'm not, man, if you would just do this, and they will say, no, I can't do it. I, 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 but then my favorite part of the deathbed is when the person goes into that uh unconscious state for hours and hours or days and days and days and i think surely the lord is there with them yes interceding and having the like dtr like hey here's who i am like who do you say that i am right in this space where there's everybody else the rest of the world is shut out and it's just you and me and like let's talk about this i love you i want you with me like, here's how I've shown up for you in ways that you never even saw throughout the course of your life. You know, come with me. And, you know, and then in those, in that subconscious time, they're able to, like, have that personal dialogue with the Lord before he ushers them to eternity. Right. So that's my favorite part of the, the deathbed. A lot of people are frustrated with it because they're like, my person can't hear me anymore. I feel like they're just lingering. I don't know why they're just like, what's the purpose of this time? It seems yes. like a waste. And I'm like, yeah, I think they're with the Lord. I think they're sorting things out yeah. before he yeah. says, OK, game game over. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think so. And I think there are other times when when they have decided, I don't want you to be my king. And that's why the parable's there, mm -hmm. because it's a reality. And, uh, and they will say, I choose not to at this time. I never could, and I'm not going to do it now. Wow. And, and, and all you can do is say, well, then it's your choice. It's your choice. Yeah. It's, your choice. Yeah. And, uh, it's sad, but, it's, but, but I think that's yeah. why that's there. And, and, I'm, yeah. and I'm curious, just to try and not modernize the, the parable, but I'm just curious, what does a modern-day example of the third, uh, is it third owner or third? Third servant. Third servant that hides. Third kind, yeah. Yeah, her, yeah. that hides the mina in the cloth. What would, what would be a 2021, if we were to retell that parable, what would that look like? Wow. That's a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, I, and I hesitate yeah. to paint my picture only because... I, I, I'm, if I do, I'm only going after yeah. one type of a person, right? Yeah. But, but really, I think what it is is it's somebody who doesn't recognize it's not theirs. Mm. So they come to church, but they're coming to church because they want God to do things for them. Yeah. They want God to be their genie. Yeah. Uh, they want God to bless them financially. They want God to bless them with a relationship, whatever it all is. So they're acting that part out, but they don't see their stuff, who they are, who they are, mm -hmm. who God's created them to be, and what they have as His, mm -hmm. and so because of that, they're not they're not using it for Him. That would be to me the modern day yeah. parable, and we see those people all the time. Yeah, and uh, I won't just to to be nice. I won't call out <laughs> names, but uh, <laughs> but we do see them, and yeah. we see them week in and week yeah. out often. And as I said, they're the ones that scare me the most yeah. because, my gosh, they're missing out on what yeah. God really has for them. And it's honestly just because, because we get all about ourselves, mm -hmm. and it's easy to do that. I mean, I'm yeah. not I'm not saying it's not easy to do. It is easy to yeah. do, and it's not as simple as finances. It's not no, it's no, not, no, no. They're just not tithing, or they're just not serving. It's no. also not giving any of that glory or respect back to God. Right. As well. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Although we could talk about the the other part of that too. <laughs> Yeah, I just read this really interesting story last night about a woman who had grown up very wealthy in San Francisco, mm -hmm. um, incredibly wealthy, and um, had 10 children. And, the, and when she turned 60, she said, I want to give the rest of my life to the Lord. And she went and joined uh, 
convent, a cloistered convent, um, Mm -hmm. which means like you don't ever leave your solitude. And she said, I spent the first 30 years of my life for myself, the next 30 years raising my family, and my last 30 years, I just want to be me and the Lord. And she like, she's still, actually, she just died last week. That's why her story came out. But anyhow, I thought that was so interesting to segment um, your priorities yeah. like that in such uh, clearly marked out chapters of life. Yeah. But how really the challenge is, is integrating. Yeah. Weaving those together. All of yeah. that. Yes. So instead of me just saying like, hey, I'll just give you the last 30, Lord. It's mm-hmm. like, actually, I'll give you all of me now yes. as mm-hmm. I raise my children, yes. as I go about, you know, my profession or my life, you know, that I'm, I, will serve you wholeheartedly throughout that. Yeah. So I think that's a real challenge. It is a real challenge, and I'm glad you pointed out the, the appropriate and more difficult... Very difficult. ...way of, of navigating that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think after I had 10 kids, I'd probably want to go in a convent, too. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I'd be like, I mean, <laughs> yeah. for all the reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it makes me think back. There was a, there was a song... It's funny. It was a Hill song by Hillsong United, obviously, but um, it was kind of r- around the same album that uh, like Oceans came off mm. of and all of that. And the song is called Tapestry, and it's mm. all about like our lives are we're wove together, yeah, like, wove together in this tapestry of like other Christians along with oh. Jesus and all of that. And to think about like her life, right, where just like one strand mm. get, comes in for thirty years, and mm. there's these two little. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. tassels coming off yeah. the tapestry <laughs> of like, oh, you know, I'll separate that. But I think it is, it's challenging, mm-hmm. but it's the way that we're supposed to live our life of there's not this, there's not these containers, you know, like right. this is, this is my, I think some of us do it Sundays. This is oh. our Jesus time, you know, yes. like this right. is our yes. container and then. We're only yeah. staying in our tithe and then we're not generous of spirit to like yeah. meet outside that it's yeah. like well no it's i've already given my tithe yeah. right. so i wouldn't want to give any more yeah <laughs> you know right exactly right. yeah right well like monday through friday is work and career and then like saturday sunday's family and then i'll give jesus like the two hours sunday morning and we'll yeah move on from i'm there. all good to go yeah so yeah. Yeah. it's i've covered my priorities i can exactly. check them all off yep exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah it feels manageable uh, yeah. at least I guess. Yeah. yeah i could see the appeal of it right of yeah what was that analogy they used to do uh, that women's brains are like spaghetti and then men's are like waffles, right? Like the squares <laughs> yes. that we like to live in and everything's woven together for women. Except for that lady. She was very... Yeah. Waffle. She box. was a waffle, yeah. Put it in the box. <laughs> Put it in the box, man. Yeah. She also had 10 kids yeah. and she was like, I'm yeah. out. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Um, yeah. Was this, was this a difficult sermon to put together? Was it easy? Was it a little in between? Um, yeah, in between. You know, you know for me... Once I feel like, okay, this is where I think God wants me to go. And and where for me, the way it works the best is just like that. The scripture informs everything. And then I'm wrestling with it until, you know, until those pieces start coming together. And when I can step back and start to see that, and even like you said about um, what well, that seems kind of harsh, I recognize that because yeah. I had that thought, right? And then to, to process that, I think that to me is where the joy comes, but... Um, that's also where the the the, the struggle comes because you're thinking about it and, th- and then and then th- and then from I'm always wanting to say how do, how can I articulate this in a way that it's easy to get it mm-hmm. even though it's taken me a long time to get there can I present it in a way that it's easy for somebody else to get and then take it and own, and be able to own it from there and and then give them a different view of how they otherwise might read that yeah yeah well I think I think also why that that harshness that Jesus presents in the in the parable is so difficult is because I think and this is going to get into you know where you fall theologically what is Brian what is it Armenian or Calvinist yes wait no no for uh, oh we've really lost Brian when when you're talking about like the holy the Trinity is like an egg or is like a you know what I'm talking about a water vapor what is that what are the what are the two thoughts Water. Well, yes, but the where you fall. Do you remember, oh. Brian? 
Yeah. Well, this is funny. I wanted to avoid this, and I just made it more obvious that we're <laughs> struggling. Okay. With it. But I think it's what's what is difficult is Jesus, at least the Jesus that I came to know when I was early in my faith was the hippie version of God, like just peace and love, man, you know? And then you get examples of Old Testament God that is just, you know, fire, brimstone, wrath, you know, righteous anger, stuff like that. And it's, I feel like for a lot of people, wherever they're at in their spiritual walk is, I don't know if I can reconcile the Old Testament God and Jesus, right? Like they feel like very different people, but when you look at the Trinity, you know, three and one, I think that's what's, at least what was hard for me when I first read that and right. saw the harshness is like, oh, I don't see Jesus as the angry one, but it's in there somewhere, right? Right. The righteous anger and, yes. and the justice yes. is in there somewhere, but I think a lot of times it's easier for us, at least for me, I'll say that, to separate those three things, right? Yeah. I'm okay with God being the Old Testament, you know, fiery. Yes. <laughs> but Jesus, yeah. but as Jesus, long as yeah. don't Jesus get mad. Can, as yeah. long as but Jesus, Jesus come along and make yeah. it all good, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. I think, you know, my wife and I had quite a deal with this because that was always her perspective. Mm-hmm. And she said, I grew up that way. And I, and I, and I will acknowledge, I kind of did too. Yeah. And I can remember when it changed for me was when I began to think about, but wait a minute, what's God's character? Yeah. What does the Bible say about his character? And then I could go back and read the Old Testament and go, oh, what looks like him being really yeah. angry is actually an incredible amount of patience. It, he gave yeah. him 200 years <laughs> yeah. to come around. Yeah. He's got way more patience than me. Yeah. He should have bludgeoned him, you yeah. know? I mean, and, and I think that it, and it allowed me to actually go, okay, if it looks that way, mm-hmm. that's outside of his character. So that So what am I missing? Yeah. And then you can go back and kind of relook at it from with a new lens, yeah. you know, and uh, and that's really helpful. But but just thinking, if he is completely love, God is love, and he is completely just, God mm-hmm. is just. How do those two go together? Yeah, and that's the nuance that I think if we if we put that on as one set of our glasses on each mm-hmm. side, and then we're we're looking at that, then it lets us look at that last grouping of yeah. and that he's saying, or the first ones who are saying, I don't, I'm, I don't want him, and say it's actually loving mm-hmm. that he's given them what he wants, but he's also carrying out being perfectly just. Yeah. So. Modalism. Arianism. Okay, thank you. There is a lot more. Um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I was just going to real fast say justice can often appear um, harsh, Mm -hmm. but really it is what we want from a God that he would be so so, uh, wise and able to enact fairness and justice and love, all those things. We wouldn't want um, a willy-nilly, unpredictable, like just lashing out for no reason kind of God who is all-powerful and in the heat of a moment, could be, I don't know, kind of just out of yeah. control. It's like, no, he's not that. But it it, it is shocking sometimes when we see Enneagri- Enneagram 8 Jesus show up. On yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he's got that wing, the Enneagram yeah. 8 wing, and yeah. he's like, we're used to him being the 9, but yeah. then he's got that 8 wing. Tables are going over, whips coming yeah. out. Yeah, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> yeah. just another facet. Could you imagine Jesus as an Enneagram 7? Like, just, <laughs> I can't imagine it. Like, I just, yeah. As a 7, I just could not imagine Jesus being like me. It, I won't die. Bo- I won't maybe go in heaven. Yeah, that, maybe yeah. in heaven. You yeah. guys get to enjoy that. I part saw though. Jesus the 7 at the um, wedding feast, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That was Jesus the 7, for sure. He but, was making sure everyone had a good time. Yeah. But yeah. also, maybe. Maybe the loaves and the fishes. That sounds like a seven, not really preparing for everything. And like, I'll <laughs> figure it out when we get there. That's a very seven like <laughs> attitude. So Oh my God. <laughs> Love it. Oh yeah. Love it. Yeah. Walking on the water. Yeah. That yeah. is that so too, fun. Yeah. <laughs> Way fun party trick. <laughs> um, uh, any other questions that we should hop into? Brian? Okay. No. Brian, <laughs> oh my gosh, clock. work with He's us. He's going, man, we gotta be done. We gotta be done. Yeah. Come on, you guys. I'm running the tech here. Yeah. Let's get this thing done, though. All right. Well, 
if there's no other questions, um, also a great segue. If you have questions based oh. off the sermons, oh, yes. please yes. write in to, did we say Cliff at Arbor Church? That's what we're sending them? Yep. All right, so Cliff at ArborChurch.com. If there's something in the past or the most recent sermon that you uh, would like us to talk about, hear a different perspective, or have us dive deeper into it, um, we'd love to answer those questions. So any question, sermon specific, send it in. We'll talk about it at uh, cliff at arborchurch.com. But other than that, uh, Thank we're you for gonna... that. Thank you for the caveat. What? Sermon related. Yes, yeah, sermon I related. I don't want the ones that just give me the <laughs> Oh, send those to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Send, send those to others. Allison at arborchurch.com. Yes. <laughs> Dear Abby's so. mom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, well, thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you, or listening, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.